Welcome to the Man of Recaps. This is The Legend of Korra, full series recap. In the last airbender, Aang and Team Avatar defeated the Fire Lord and saved the world. On the burned section of the Earth Kingdom, they built Republic City, where people of all nations could live together in peace. Aang lived a long, happy life, but eventually the Avatar cycle of reincarnation continued into Korra. She's a real physical, bust in fists, blazing kind of Avatar. She spent her life so far at her home in the Southern Water Tribe, training with the members of the White Lotus, including Katara, who must be real old now. She's already mastered three of the four elements. The only one left is air, but who's going to teach her airbending? Aang was the last airbender. Luckily, Aang had an airbending kid. It's Tenzin, who's already got three young airbending kids of his own. He takes Korra with him back to Republic City, a shiny beacon of modern times, yet technology's progressed very quickly since the last airbender. Korra immediately starts fighting some local gangs, but the city doesn't need her help. They've got a highly trained police force of metal benders. Yeah, our girl Toph from the last airbender, after she invented metal bending, founded the Republic City police force. Current chief is Toph's daughter, Linde Fong, and like her mother, she's kind of grumpy. On Air Temple Island, Korra's beginning her airbending training, but she's not really the meditating type. The airbending philosophy of don't attack evade is not really her style. What is her style is the wildly popular Pro Bending League. Yeah, they've turned bending into an organized sport. She befriends Earthbender Bo Lin, who's the real nice funny guy type. He's on the fire ferrets named after his animal companion, Pabu. His brother's a firebender named Mako, who much like Zuko is a real serious angsty boy type. Conveniently, they just lost their waterbender, so Korra joins the team, and organized sports turns out to be the perfect way for her to understand the concepts of airbending. But there's a new danger growing in Republic City, a group called the Equalists, non-benders who are sick of being oppressed by the bending elite. They're led by their super cool masked leader, Amon. And somehow he has the ability, just like Aang did to Fire Lord Ozai, to take people's bending away permanently. Meanwhile, the Fire Ferrets have won their way into the championship tournament. Unfortunately, they don't have enough money to pay the entrance fee. But that changes when Mako gets hit by a scooter driven by an absolute knockout Asami. She's a huge pro bending fan and conveniently super rich. Her father, Hiroshi Sato, is one of the biggest industrialists in the city and agrees to sponsor the Fire Ferrets. So the team is doing great until Korra confesses her crush on Mako, but Mako Mako just started dating Asami, awkward. But Bolin has a crush on Korra and she agrees to go out with him, which makes Mako jealous and he confesses he likes Korra and they kiss right when Bolin sees. It's a mess and it ruins their team chemistry. Eventually they agree this love square thing is dumb, let's all just be friends. Now Korra doesn't like Asami at first, she's jealous about Mako and thinks she's just a sissy rich girl. But actually Asami's a huge badass who likes extreme sports and soon she and Korra are BFFs. But turns out Asami's father is working for the Equalists. Yes, a bender killed his wife and it turned him into a villain. He's built these epic robots designed to take down benders and they're made out of platinum so metal benders can't bend them. He's like, Asami, join me on the dark side. But she's like, no thanks, Pops, I'm gonna be a good guy. So she and the gang make it their mission to take down the Equalists and they form the new Team Avatar. They're not riding around on a fluffy animal, though. They got a sweet sports car and a super cool steampunk vibe. Councilman Tarlock is also committed to fighting him on, but he's clearly just using this to gain power for himself. Pretty soon, Korra finds out he's a villain, but not just any villain, he's a bloodbender. Yes, the terrifying technique we learned about in The Last Airbender where you bend the water in a person's body to control them. He locks Korra in his basement where she finally succeeds at meditating and meets a grown-up Aang. Oh, he got hot. He was working with police chief adult Toph and councilman adult Sokka to take down a notorious gangster who turns out is a prodigy bloodbender, can do it not during the full moon and without even moving. Aang eventually goes avatar state and takes his bending away. Turns out councilman Tarlock is his son back for revenge. But you know who hates all benders? Amon. And somehow bloodbending doesn't affect him. Oh, he takes this guy's bending away. One villain down, but Amon's the bigger threat. With Asami's father's help, he's got an arm and taken over the city. But Republic City's got an army of their own, led by General Iroh, Zuko's grandson. Unfortunately, Asami's father has just invented airplanes and, oh, wipes out their whole fleet. So Korra and Mako use a stealth approach where they find a locked up Tarlock who explains that Amon is his brother. Yeah, their father escaped and started a new life where he had two sons and tried to teach them the art of bloodbending to come back and get revenge. Amon especially got very good at it and found a way through bloodbending to take people's bending away. And now he's got Korra. Oh no, it's happening. Yes, he's taken away the Avatar's bending. But wait, what's this? An airbending punch. Yeah, she had never airbended before, so I guess he couldn't take it away. And with that, boom, blasts him out the window. Amon's exposed as a waterbender and loses all his followers, so he's got a piece out of there. He grabs his brother with a speedboat, and it's like, yes, brother, we'll come back together and conquer the city later. But Tarlock realizes now he and his brother are the bad guys, and so what's this? Oh, a brother murder suicide. Heavy. Korra's bending, though, seems to be permanently gone until she meets adult Aang. He's like, what's up, girl? Uh, me and all your past lives are here to help. Unlocks your bending, and yeah, Avatar's back in action. She and Mako start making out, and that's the end of book 
one. In Book 2, Spirits, Korra goes home to the Southern Water Tribe for the annual Spirits Festival. Unalak, the chief of the Northern Water Tribe, comes too. That is Korra's father's brother, and they don't like each other. Unalak brings his twin kids with them, Eska and Desna, and Bolin's got a huge crush on whichever one's the girl. Bolin may have bitten off more than he can chew here. He spends the season trying to dump her, but she does not let him. Meanwhile, Unalak is a real party pooper. He's like, this fun festival disgraces the spirits. He may be right, though, because that night a dark spirit attacks, and only Unalak knows the way to, like, disperse it. He's like, Avatar, I need your help to restore balance. We've got to go down to the Southern Spirit Portal, where you can use your Avatar powers to, boom, reopen it, uh, so the day is saved. But the next day, Unalak's whole army arrives and occupies the Southern Water Tribe. He's like, trust me, I'm a good guy, but it's soon apparent he's not. Meanwhile, Asami is running her father's company and has a meeting with another wealthy industrialist and the best character on the show, it's Varric. He is a wacky, insane genius, basically Tony Stark on steroids. He's never far from his assistant, Julie, and has this catchphrase, Julie, do the thing. He and Team Avatar escape on his yacht back to Republic City, where they try to convince the president to help. But he's like, hey, I can't intervene in internal water tribe affairs. Mako actually takes the president's side. He's become a Republic City cop and chooses his duty over Korra, so oh, she dumps his ass. She's going back down to fight Unalak herself, but oh, a giant dark spirit comes and eats her. Varric takes Bolin under his wing. He's making propaganda films about the water tribe civil war and casts Bolin as the lead. About one day after after Korra leaves, Mako and Asami get back together. Mako's investigating a bombing and finds out that the pyrotechnics in the movie is the same remote detonator that Varric invented. Yes, Varric is the bad guy, but he can't prove it. Varric has him framed and arrested. Korra wakes up on an island with amnesia and has a spirit vision quest to learn about the first avatar, Wan. In ancient times, humanity lived on giant lion turtles who would give them the power of bending temporarily to defend themselves against the spirits. Wan eventually befriended the spirits and when he saw these giant kite ones fighting, decided to break it up. But ooh, that was the evil Vatu and now he's let it escape. The good spirit Spirit Rava is like, hey, I need your help. See, normally humans can only have one type of bending, but if I give you some of my power, you can have multiple at a time. So Wan traveled around to the Lion Turtles, got all the bending, and mastered all the elements. So on the day of Harmonic Convergence, Wan and Rava came to face Vatu, and with their powers combined, Avatar State managed to seal him away for good. And they closed the portals to the spirit world so Vatu could never escape. So thus began the legacy of the Avatar, charged with keeping balance in the world, and it's Rava's spirit that passes on and reincarnates him when he dies. Tenzin, meanwhile, has been on vacation with his family, including his siblings. Yeah, Aang Tara had two other kids. He's the only airbender though, his sister Kai is a waterbender, and his brother Boomy is not a bender, but he is insane and hilarious. Eventually Korra comes back with the bad news that Unalak's gonna release the evil spirit and take over the world or whatever. Tenzin tries to help Korra meditate into the spirit world, but it's actually his oldest daughter Janora who has the natural connection to the spirits. And who does Korra meet in the spirit world but Uncle Iroh! Apparently near the end of his life he decided to abandon his body and come to the spirit world for permanent retirement, and in true Uncle Iroh fashion he gives Korra some good tea and good advice. The mission's a huge failure though because Janora gets captured and Unalak forces Korra to open the other spirit portal. Back in Republic City, Bolin's a full-on movie star now, and the fictional Unalak is carrying out his master plan, while the real Unalak's kidnapping the president. While Nuktuk saves the day on screen, Bolin saves the day in real life, but turns out they weren't sent by Unalak, they were sent by Varric! Oh, the jig's up! Varric points out, though, that he's not really a bad guy. His whole plot to capture the president and blame it on Unalak was just to get Republic City to join the war. If anything, he's the good guy. Korra comes back, excited to see her boyfriend, Mako. Yeah, she's got just enough amnesia, she doesn't remember that they broke up, and the love triangle is back on. Anyway, Team Avatar is going to the North Pole to stop Unalak, and long story short, they get to the spirit world just too late, it's harmonic convergence, and Vatu is released from his prison. Korra goes Avatar State and fights this giant kite, but this time Vatu's got his own human champion, and Unalak becomes the Dark Avatar. They have an Avatar fight, Unalak doesn't have all the elements by the way, just water, but he does have a huge power up and is able to pull Rava out of Korra. He starts bashing Rava directly, which erases Korra's past lives until BAM Rava destroyed and the Avatar cycle ended. Then he turns into a giant spirit monster and attacks Republic City. Now Republic City is not defenseless, it's got a strong modern army led by General Iroh, but they weren't prepared for a giant spirit monster and Unalak wipes out his whole fleet. Then Korra meditates in a tree and becomes a giant spirit of herself and they have a huge kaiju fight in the harbor. We're in full anime mode now, I have no idea what's happening. But in the end, Korra is able to save a fragment of the spirit of Rava and destroy Unalak and the uh, Avatar is back in business. But the memory of all those past lives were permanently erased, so that's kind of a bummer. Korra's gonna reseal the spirit portals, but she's like, wait a second, maybe I should leave them open and humans and spirits can live together in harmony. Tenzin, you're wise, what do you think? And he's like, Korra, I'm gonna be honest with you, I have no idea what's going on, I'm just sticking around because I heard season three is pretty cool. So now it's book three, Change, where spirits have re-inhabited the world, which is nice, except that sometimes they do it in the middle of the city. But there's an unexpected side effect. Uncle Boomy is now an airbender. What? And it's not just him. A bunch of random people have suddenly developed airbending. Opening the spirit portals is bringing balance back to the world. So the gang's gonna fly around the world finding airbenders on Asami's awesome new blimp. 
By the way, Korra finally remembered that she and Mako broke up, and they agree it's best if we're just friends. Mako's very awkward for a bit around both Korra and Asami, but this just brings the girls closer together. Now Tenzin is very excited to rebuild the Air Nomad Nation, but turns out most people are not cut out to be monks. They find one promising recruit, though, a young orphan named Kai, who starts out as a bit of a thief and a con artist, but eventually becomes part of the family. But now, in a secret prison on top of a mountain, is Zahir. He was so dangerous, he was locked up here without even being a bender, and now he has airbending, so he busts out of there, no problem. He travels to a wooden prison in the middle of the ocean and tosses some rocks to his earthbending buddy, who's mastered a special technique of lava bending. In a metal prison in the middle of a volcano is a woman with no arms, but when they give her some water, oh, she's water bending arms, what a crazy technique. These three breakouts attract the attention of our boy, Fire Lord Zuko. He teams up with Korra's dad to stop Zaheer, but Zaheer's too much of a badass. He rescues their firebender, a real tall girl with, oh, what's this? The combustion man tattoos? Yeah, sparky, sparky, boom. Now, unaware of this trouble brewing, Team Avatar has made it to the grand metropolis of Ba Sing Se. Unfortunately, the modern era has only increased the divide between the rich and poor, as the new Earth Queen is a terrible person who cares more about her shrubberies than caring for her citizens. She tells Korra there are no airbenders in Ba Sing Se, which seems unlikely, and indeed the Dai Li are kidnapping them and conscripting them into an airbender army. Team Avatar won't stand for that and breaks them all out, which unfortunately makes them enemies of the Earth Kingdom. But all these new airbenders who can't go home are happy to join the new air nation. Team Avatar's last stop is the super cool new metal city of Zhao Fu. The earthbenders here have turned metal bending into a true art form, and they're led by Zhu Yin Bei Fong. Yes, that is Toph's other daughter. She and her sister Lin do not get along, though. It's a whole thing going back to their childhood, and eventually they fight it out and then make up. Zhu Yin teaches Korra metal bending, which she picks up pretty quickly, but Bo Lin can't pick it up at all. But he does pick up her daughter Opal, a real nice girl. They hit it off, and turns out she's the new airbender they're here to recruit. But Zaheer's gang shows up with a dastardly plot to kidnap the Avatar, and it turns into an epic fight. Long story short, Korra tracks him to the spirit world, where he explains he's a member of the Red Lotus. According to him, the White Lotus has been corrupted. They're now just pawns of the establishment that keep people oppressed. The Red Lotus is all about true freedom, which in his mind is anarchy. Korra's like, you know, governments are bad sometimes. In fact, the villains have been corrupt politicians in every single season so far. But also, you go around killing people, so clearly you're the bad guy. There's some more shenanigans I'm not going to get into, but basically Zaheer gets to the Earth Queen and uses his new airbending powers to, oh, create a vacuum and suffocate her. And with the Earth Queen dead, he incites an anarchist revolution in Ba Sing Se. Then he kidnaps the new airbenders, but Daddy Tenzin ain't messing around. Oh, he shows him what a real airbending master looks like. Zaheer captures Korra, but he's cornered on the mountaintop, but he's been studying the teachings of this ancient air master. Zaheer's like, all right, let's do this. Falls off the mountain, but oh, he can fly now. All right. The rest of the gang is having some lava trouble, so Bolin steps up and oh, he figured out lava bending. Congrats, buddy. So Zaheer wants to kill the Avatar by poisoning her with some metal so she'll go into the Avatar state and kill her then, ending the cycle of reincarnation. Only flaw in the plan is that when she goes into the Avatar state, she's real strong and busts out of there. So Korra and Zaheer are flying around having a big old fight, but oh, the poison's still in her system. It's weakened her. Zaheer's got the upper hand and he's starting to suffocate her. But wait, what's this? It's all the new airbenders forming a big old tornado to give Korra the upper hand and take Zaheer down. They get the poison out of Korra, and Zaheer is defeated, so the day is saved. Except the poison took a huge toll on Korra's body. She's grievously injured. Will she ever be the same? So now it's time for Book 4, Balance. There's a three-year time gap, and the Earth Kingdom is still in anarchy. Luckily, the new airbenders are here to save the day with their updated modern wingsuit uniforms. Cool. But they're not the only ones keeping peace in the Earth Kingdom. On an awesome new metal magnet train, the Zaofu security forces are here, led by Kuvira. She's bringing order to the chaos and reuniting the fragmented Earth Kingdom. In fact, Bolin is here working for her, as well as Varric. But the stability she offers comes with a steep price. These mostly autonomous provinces must hand over full central control directly to Kuvira, the Great Uniter. Now the heir to the Earth Kingdom is Prince Wu, a spoiled brat living it up in Republic City with Mako as his security chief. But Kuvira is like, hey, does anyone really want this guy to be their king? I think the time of the monarchy's over. I declare a new Earth Empire. What does the Avatar have to say about this? Well, Korra's missing in action. She spent a long time recovering down at the South Pole and finally decided to symbolically cut her hair and travel the world to find herself. She's in a bad way, though, being haunted by herself and finally finds our girl Toph. Yeah, just the Toph we remember from Last Airbender, except super old now, hermit living in a swamp. She can sense there's a little bit of the metal poison left in her system and long story short, helps Korra get it out of her. So Kuvira's army is headed back to Zhao Fu to take it by force if necessary, but the Avatar is here to stop her. She fights Kuvira one-on-one, -on -one, but Korra's still not really on top of her game and Kuvira 
absolutely trashes her. Around this time, Boleyn realizes he's working for the bad guy, and Varric comes to the same conclusion. In fact, Varric's been experimenting with spirit vines as a source of energy, but turns out they're way unstable and explode. Kuvira wants Varric to weaponize it for her, but he refuses, so he's under arrest. But what's this? His loyal assistant, Julie, abandons him? She's like, yeah, he treats me like garbage, makes me scrub his feet and stuff. Luckily, Varric and Boleyn manage to escape and get back to Republic City to warn them of a new super weapon. Earlier, Boleyn and Opal had a huge fight and broke up because he didn't realize he was working for the bad guy. So now he's doing whatever it takes to win her back, including going on a secret mission to rescue her family, along with her grandma Toph. The family gets rescued, but the Spirit Vine Super Cannon is complete. Julie helped build it, but it keeps malfunctioning, and pretty soon Kuvira realizes that Julie was lying to her. She's always been loyal to Varric and a good guy. Then the Beifongs bust in, have a big old metal bending fight. Toph unleashes a huge earthquake, but they're outnumbered and have to escape. Bolin's redeemed himself, he and Opal get back together, and Varric and Julie are reunited, but she's like, hey mister, some of the stuff I said about you not appreciating me was real, so you better shape up. Now the world can't really stop Kuvira, so the plan is to just let her have the Earth Kingdom, but Kuvira looked at a map and decided that Republic City should be part of the Earth Empire. It's time to invade. Now Republic City's not defenseless, they've got a strong modern army, still led by General Iroh. The only problem would be the Super Spirit Cannon, but that's stuck on the train track. Except, Kuvira's ditched the train and mounted the cannon on a ridiculous giant robot! And once again, it immediately wipes out General Iroh's fleet. It's up to Team Avatar to stop this thing, but it is pretty much invulnerable. Luckily, we've got two super geniuses on our team. Three if you count Asami's dad, who's released from prison. They build a hummingbird robot with lasers that can cut through platinum, and Asami's dad has to sacrifice himself to save the day. With the way inside, Team Avatar leaps into action, Korra goes for the rematch with Kuvira, and does a lot better this time. Then Mako hits the Spirit Vine engine with lightning, and blam! Blows this robot apart. Kuvira escapes to the spirit forest where guess what landed? The cannon! Boom! Point blank blast, avatar state block, and explosion! It unleashes so much spirit energy that a new spirit portal opens up right here in the middle of the city. Kor and Kuvira land in the spirit world where it's like, so you recognize you've become the bad guy in this situation, right? And she's like, yeah, I, I kind of realized. So Kuvira surrenders and the day is saved. When things were looking bleak, Varric proposed to Julie, admitting that she's more than his assistant, she's his partner. So the series ends with a big wedding. Korra and Mako do not rekindle their romance, though. It's been too much. They're just friends. It's actually Asami that Korra's talking to at the end. It's like, you know what? Screw the boys. Let's go on a girl's vacation to the spirit world. And what's this? They're holding hands. Whoa! It's been apparent their friendship's been grown into something more for a while now, so more power to them. And that's where Legend of Korra comes to an end. If you liked this recap, hit that subscribe button for more of the best recaps of TV and movies.